So, should we start or should we wait for someone, for a special guest to come? No special guests? Okay, great. So hi everybody, and uh, I have introduced myself already. I'm Edward, I came from Latvia, and uh, my official title is software development coach, uh, because if you call yourself consultant, no one will trust you, right? So I'm software development coach, not a consultant. And most of the time, I work on reducing complexity. I actually help people deliver stuff and get things done in, a, in, in the most effective and efficient way. Therefore, I hate Jira, all right? And I see the pool room packed of people who are fed up of this enterprise stuff, right? Because I also believe that uh, in enterprise agile and large scale uh, and agile can be fun to work with and it can be lightweight, right? Do you, do you, do you believe it? That it can be the case? Who believes that enterprise or large scale, large scale agile can be fun? Exactly, it should be fun, right? So it's, it's about people, it's about work and all this stuff. Okay, first of all, before, before I start, I want to make some noise in Twitter. Just give me a second, I want to take a selfie. <laughs> just a second, we have uh, more than enough time, just give me a, just, 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 just smile, guys, because as I usually say, I have to, uh, because I will publish it on the social networks, and if you will not smile, people will, will think that I, will, I suck at conferences, right? <laughs> and they will be right anyway. <laughs> Just smile, I see the one guy is with a sad face, so. <laughs> Just smile, we're seriously, guys, you're not smiling. Oh yeah, oops, oh, where's my face? Here it goes. Yeah, that's it. And I, I'll publish it on Twitter later. So, I promised you jackpot, right? Here it goes, I promised you girls. <laughs> no boys, I promised you beer. By the way, we have a beer bottle. Roman, give me a bottle of beer, please. Here it goes. Anyone, beer? <laughs> no? Okay. Here it goes. Please pass, p p pass beer to, to that guy. Exactly. I want to get drunk after Jira talks as well. <laughs> that's how it is. Oh, and my slides crashed. Just give me a second. Wow, wow, that's a risky one. That's a risky moment. Th it's a sabotage. It's called agile sabotage. People fr in a different room are just, just trying to break things here, right? Because we're technical guys. Who's a technical guy? Who's a technical girl? <laughs> I caught you, right? Good, great. So, uh, great. So, by the way, I also found um, jackpot beer girl. <laughs> All in one. That's funny, yeah? Ye yesterday, I didn't know that uh, such a thing can exist. So, I'm going to talk about uh, software architecture and the patterns with you, things that I find prevailing in no nowadays in different projects, boring enterprises or small startups. So, basically, I see the same things all the time. And it's not gonna be very very deeply technical uh, stuff, but I encourage you to listen because uh, maybe you'll get at least a few takeaways and a food for thought. So, let's start with the first one, anti-pattern, which is called Yagni architecture. Or basically, you ain't gonna need that architecture, right? So, the thing is that, uh, Yagni architecture uh, comes because we have a fetish on the technologies. As a software developers and technical guys, we're kind of buzzword fetishists, right? We really love our software to be fancy, very great, and nowadays everyone would like our software to be like reactive, right? Reactive because it's the way to go, or microservices, yeah, it's the way to go. We want our software to be backed by Cassandra or MongoDB, even if you have only one JSON document to store, right? No problem, we also want five nines uptime because it's about resilience. John Allspall tells everyone that everything should be resilient, right? There's no way to go without resilience and blah, blah. And there are reasons for that. First of all, it's about fashion, right? It's a fashion. We want to work on the fancy stuff and we want to be modern and fashion, which is good. There's also a tendency, uh, something that, that's called like a CV-driven architecture, right? Uh, basically, uh, we are <laughs> people hunt us on LinkedIn uh, via buzzwords. They look for us via some fancy skills like big data. So if you don't have big data skill at LinkedIn, probably you're kind of you'll not be found by a great innovative company. And you're lucky enough if your company understands that and lets you use these fancy technologies, right? It's called architecture. Architecture based, ar architecture based on marketing because basically you can. It's really a pr it's 
pretty hard to hire developers which uh, for a company which does not really uh, use fancy technologies, right? If you run on an old stack, you can't really attract people, and that's a huge problem nowadays. So you have to look at this market architecture direction. But it's a problem, because, and here's the story. Basically, I had a friend of mine uh, who recently produced a tweet, about a year ago recently. Uh, he said, well, how can I get the business blessing to break application into a microservices? I said, well, you have to find the constraint, basically find the problem. Maybe there is a microservice that, uh, there is a service that slows you, you down for some reason, like a rip it out from your application and observe. Stop and observe and see. Maybe there are more bottlenecks, but stop. Don't just try to break the whole monolithic application into microservices. And it made, it made him extremely sad. It made him very, very sad because he was so enthusiastic about microservices that he didn't really want to do it. He said, Eddie, you're talking crap. You don't get microservices. That's the way to go, right? That's the way to go. That's the only way to go. And basically, uh, what he said, I'm going to exaggerate the problem, and I'm going to convince the business and sell them, sell them the idea of microservices. He won. He sold the idea of microservices. That's that's the way to go. It's scale software development, but they had like 15 developers in the team. Well, well what a problem, right? And uh, he spent a year on this microservices with his team. He created a tiger team around microservices. That's how it usually happens. And then you know what? He left. <laughs> he left just before the, uh, the moment when company realized that they spent First one, just leave your company. Just leave your company and find some other company that is innovative enough for you, where you can apply your skill set and, I don't know, use Cassandra, uh, Mongos, Eric Java, all these fancy technologies and just be happy. But maybe your company is not for you, seriously. Just what's better, to be ethical or lie to someone or spend someone's money, which is usually not yours. And, uh, th but there is a second option as well. Maybe you can find the way how, you, how to make your particular business innovative. Maybe you can find the place where you can introduce some cool business change and technical innovation will follow. Basically, business innovation comes first and then technical innovation follows, which is a good thing. And I have a, re a real example, like, uh, basically, uh, I worked with a team uh, which found out that in their product there was a problem with the reporting. Basically, they didn't have a reporting. Uh, 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 and uh, they introduced like, Kibana and some other tools like that led them, uh, that gave a business more insight to their software and uh, gave some data and they showed the demo to, to the management and management said, wow, that's a great thing. And they did it. In the spare time, actually. 
and they end up in the big data project in a year because they got business buy-in. So they found the place where their business sucked. They solved the problem and they brought innovation. If they didn't do that, they would never get this big data stuff, right? So that was my message. Uh, but there's an alternative to, to Yagni architecture called kindness architecture. Don't try to Google it. It's my invention. It's, it's copyrighted. <laughs> kind as architecture. Or keep it need driven and simple, sir. <laughs> right? So le let's go to the basics. We have to understand. You want to take a picture? But we're running out of time. We don't have much time. Woohoo! We have to run fast. Agile way. So need driven. What does it mean to need driven? We have to understand the basics, the needs, uh, what our company has. Because uh, a friend of mine said once, architecture in the sake of architecture doesn't work. It just, it's nonsense. Architecture should have a purpose. So we should become better at understanding requirements, which is obvious, but we don't do that. Let's say, do you really need five nines after the dot uptime? Do you really need that? Or maybe two nines is enough. And it, it can make a huge difference. It can sa save you a millions of euros a year just because you think about it. Maybe you don't really need this one, like a like five nines after the point. Or do you need 100% data consistency? Or do you really need, let's say, uh, some high concurrency in your, ser in your application? And if you do, maybe you don't have to make your full application reactive or based, like a produced on, on top of type safe stack. Maybe you can create a se one service which is reactive and leave up the rest of the application as it is. Why not? Right? So requirements, obviously. Risks. You do you know that closure developers, they tend to drive fast motorbikes? <laughs> yeah? And uh, Cassandra experts usually uh, uh, win uh, lottery tickets. <laughs> yeah? That's the things which we usually don't take I into account when we choose technologies, right? And there are constraints. And I really like that because you should understand that your company has a different con constraints rather than Google, basically. Money, people, innovation budget, whatever. Uh, deadlines or something like that. Do you have a, I don't know, do you have a domain ex expert on board when you want to introduce domain-driven design? Everyone is blabbing about domain-driven design, right? Which is a good thing. Can you really do domain-driven design without domain expert? Well, will, will you Google domain? In, will you Google domain terms and business in uh, Wikipedia or in Google? No, you should have domain expert inside, in house. So different constraints, right? And I usually hear, but but Instagram, let's say Instagram did that. We have to go the same way because Instagram did that. Well, uh, you probably uh, heard the story that Instagram launched their product and scaled their product with two developers. On the two developers, which were ops guys, well, the two developers which served as ops guys. So they scaled their software development, but are we Instagram? Are we Instagram guys? Do we have the same skills, the same mindset? Uh, maybe we, we have wives or, ch or children and all this stuff. So absolutely different constraints, right? And the thing is that uh, I think that most flames and holy wars comes from the fact that we don't really understand the constraints that we have. And there's a massive pyramid of software development. <laughs> Basically, you, you should really understand where your company is now. Oh, so this microphone makes me crazy. Let's say, is your business profitable at this point? If it is, uh, well, maybe it's a good idea to start doing more innovations, like, I know, microservices stuff. But if your business is not profitable, should you really invest in a better technology? Maybe no. And if you look at the, uh, this picture, which is uh, uh, taken from a Lean Enterprise book, basically Lean Enterprise distinguish uh, three different evolution steps for your products, which is like, a, and the most important for me is like our, our explore and exploit. Basically, at explore stage, you don't really know what your product is and what people are willing, <laughs> and whether people are willing to pay for your product. And at this stage, do you really want to have a fanciest possible technology and apply test-driven development and blah, blah? You don't know because you don't really know whether it's worth investing in your software at this stage. And it answers a lot of questions. However, when you pass uh, this step, cross the chasm, 
and go to and enter exploit phase where you validated your business idea, maybe it's worth to invest. Right? There is a huge difference. Okay? Simplicity. I'm not going to talk about simplicity a lot. Uh, but Chad Fowler talks about simplicity, how they make simple stuff and how it's important to keep things small, tiny, without extra complexity. Kathy uh, Thier actually talks a lot about simplicity. Even by connecting the way our brain works with the way how we produce software, right? But, and this is a statement of Mr. Obvious, right? Just pick the simplest possible solution that you know and ship and just get things done, right? And uh, it's, it's very tempting when you are in a startup or you change the company, you join some startup, let's say. It's very tempting to do a startup, to run a startup and learn something new want to mix these two things together, right? You join to, uh, the, you want to create some cool product and you want to build it on the fanciest technical stack, right? That's how it is. But it's very tempting, but you have to stop this because you don't want to struggle with the fancy technologies you don't know at this stage, right? You will have to, you will have a bunch of things to learn besides technology, right? And the message is that actually it's always so easy to, to add complexity later. You can always add complexity later, but it's very hard to reduce complexity when it's there, right? So you have to start with something simple and then add complexity if you need so. Maybe you will never need that complexity, but once you have complexity in place, reducing it takes much effort, right? And optimize for change which is also important because we tend to make our architectures generic and flexible, but it comes with a cost. Uh, there's a, have you heard about use and reuse paradox? Who have heard about that? Huh, okay, so the thing is that uh, things that are easy to reuse are hard to use, <laughs> right? Because they're more complex, right? You don't know anything about the future. Future is unpredictable and uh, flexibility makes things much more complex. So what should, should we do? What should we do? We have to optimize for change. We have to optimize our design so we can change things easily and roll back our decisions. Let's say it's a very common s situation when you have, you have a, t a technical decision. Should I choose A or B? So how many options we have? Go with A. Obvious, right? Or it's not obvious. It's obvious. It's obvious, right? So go for A. Go for B. Don't decide. So, ah. And uh, you can also basically reduce the cost of your decision basically by introducing abstraction. You can make, uh, so you can go for A, but make sure that it's very easy to switch to B the next time. So you kind of choose something in the middle by abstracting things. So basically make, Things, make things easy to understand, change, and replace, and swap. Obvious, right? Nanoservice architecture. Why not micro? Because I'm afraid of, of calling anti a microservice architecture anti-pattern, because you know, if I say that, I will get a huge blame. So nanoservice architecture, right? Because most microservice architecture end up nanoservices. We end up with, a two, with the services which are too small. And it's, that's insane because industry says that our services should be of a particular size. So how big should uh, a microservice should be? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's the right answer. So what industry says? That microservice should be at most 300 lines of code, something like that. Have you heard that? I heard that. Or microservice should be rewritten in a two weeks. It's, it, you should, it should be possible to rewrite microservice in a two weeks. Or my, f my favorite, uh, a microservice team should not be bigger than a two pizza team. So basically, a team should be, a, you should be able to, fed up, to feed your team with the two pizzas. That is development microservices, right? And which is actually insane uh, because size doesn't matter. <laughs> size doesn't matter here, my friends. Here. 
<laughs> okay, so, and here's the message. You think that because you understand one, that you must therefore un understand two, because obviously one and one make two. But you forget that, that there's also end in between. Which means that actually by blindly introducing microservices, just by uh, technically splitting your monolith in the smaller services, you usually get only negative consequences. It was a pretty questionable benefits uh, if you do it blindly. I don't want to say that you get negative consequences by default, but if you do it blindly, yes, you will get troubles. Uh, because a data locality problem takes, like, uh, takes place and uh, you, are, you have to understand how to fail, uh, how to handle failures in, a in a distributed systems and blah, blah. So I would go back and just change the name of this microservice architecture pattern to service-oriented architecture because, because it makes much more sense or at least it doesn't really confuse you. It doesn't tell you that your service should be of a particular size because size doesn't matter. And... Um, Instead of this blabbing, because this mi microservice should be of a particular size, let's uh, forget about size. Okay, it's my fault. Let's forget about size and find the driving factor for the composition. There are obvious and clear driving factors that we should take into account. Here's the list of them. Team boundary. Have you heard about Conway's law? are risking missing a missing a lunch but who a lunch or a coffee break but who cares again yeah so team boundaries if you can't organize your teams around microservices don't bother with microservices just don't bother because conway's law strikes back all the time if you don't want if you don't know what conway's law is i encourage you to learn about it i'm not going to explain right now you can catch me later Frequency of change. There are two services. One service changes much more frequently than the other one, but you have to deploy them together because they are part of the same monolithic code base. Doesn't make any sense. Maybe you have to decompose. Different responsibilities. Your software systems has different responsibilities and different people are responsible for the services. Decompose. Different cross-functional requirements. Some services may go reactive. Some of them shouldn't really. Decompose. Different technical stack. I want to try Groovy or Closure. Build different service. Leave your code base, major code base, untouched. And just prototype. You say, if, if you need a prototype, create a service, just play with it and throw it out, or integrate it back as part of your software. Which is pretty simple, right? Does it say about size? Uh, is there something about size? No. That's why microservice stuff is pretty confusing. And staying big is actually okay. Absolutely okay. Because benefits of service-oriented architecture are definitely not in size. They are not in size, and you have to de decompose wisely. Okay? Structureless architecture, which is actually architecture when there's either no structure or there's a, such a structure that doesn't really bring any benefits. And here's the example. Boo. That's how we usually package our software. Controller, DAO, a domain service. Who has that? Chuk. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Come on. I know that. I know what you did last summer. <laughs> okay. So I'd like to burn this approach in fire. Really. So, uh, Uncle Bob or Robert Martin says that there is a notion of screaming architecture. Your architecture should, sh your structure should, should scream about itself, basically. It means that when you open your structure, you have to understand what your application is doing. In our case, our application is doing configuration, controller, DAO, domain, and exceptions, right? And it's insane. That's insane, but that's what I see here, and you too. That's insane. So it doesn't really reveal high-level components of the system, which is a bad thing, right? Uh, it actually does not reduce discovery cost. Basically, if I want to fix or find a source of a problem, and usually problem does not come with exceptions or 
DAO, right? There is a problem in particular functionality usually. So you have to collect your functionality back and just go to those different layers and find where your functionality actually relies, which is not very good, right? How often a source of a problem is a particular layer? Never, right? Never. And it doesn't really improve comprehensibility, meaning that I can't really study one particular, for one particular part of uh, functionality at a time. I have to care about the rest, when, because probably when you open the controller package, you will see a bunch of different controllers which are unrelated. And probably if you split controllers into smaller parts, there will be all these parts mixed together, right? Okay, and uh, it, and it actually does not enable Poca Yoka, but uh, which is a guiding principle in lean software development, like a, a constraints. Uh, basically, in this case, it's really hard to uh, express dependencies between functionality in an automated way, like by using tool like a structure 101 or maker, or I don't know, jdepend, something like that. So it's, it's very hard and uh, you, it doesn't force you to think where to put your functionality, which is a bad thing. What if you do it differently? What if we do it differently? What if we start grouping our software artifact according to functional principle? that will make our structure much more cohesive, which is a good thing, right? So, I see what our application is doing now. I see that there's a different services uh, related to groups, uh, group work, discover, meetups, membership, user registration, validation, blah, blah, blah. I can reason about my software. I can actually, let's say, and there's a different benefit that can come later. By the way, I can put acceptance tests in this, in the same in, in in these particular packages, let's say acceptance test for validations goes there, which is good. So it answers the question where to put acceptance test. Let's say discover a cost. I have a problem with uh, meetups. I go to meetups. It, it's all there, collected together. Comprehensibility. If I study meetups, I don't have to care about stuff that is related to registration, validation, blah blah. And it enables Pokeyoka. Basically, I can express functional dependencies. I can say that. User can depend on the group stuff, but not vice, vice versa, which is great. Uh, that's an interesting one. Controversial, dangerous, not, people are not doing that, but, but it's good, and it works, actually. So, what if I tell you that we can apply <laughs> service-oriented mindset to software structure and we don't really need to do distributed software development. So we can benefit from our service-oriented mindset when we work on a monolithic code base. You just keep services within your software decoupled. They communicate, there's some well-known interface, blah, blah, blah. Pretty interesting, right? And it's the first path toward SOA, true distributed SOA, because once you have a properly managed structure here, it becomes much more easier to go to a microservices, something like that. Let's say you want to extract, I don't know, a user and a registration to a separate service. You can see how it's related to the rest of the application and uh, understand the blessed radius, basically. How much effort should you put in order to go distributed, which is a good, right? Uh, do we have Java developers here, Java people? Java people, okay, I'll skip the next slide then. Uh, <laughs> Okay, let's talk about layering. Lasagna architecture. Basically, lasagna architecture, we end up with lasagna architecture when we have too much layers. Or it's also called onion architecture, because when you open so many layers, you start to cry. Just open layers and cry. And what if I will tell you that layering doesn't make any sense nowadays? Whoa, wow. That was loud, because I found the uh, official benefits of layering in a book that actually describes layering. And here's the list, and most of these things doesn't make sense nowadays. I don't want to say that layering is not needed at all, but you have to be very careful because most of the applications for some reasons are layered. However, if you use some frameworks, third-party frameworks, is there a layering in place? Most never, but for some reasons we apply this layered mindset to business software all the time. Are we doing OSI network model all the time where layers should be independent from each other and you, you can't talk to li layer uh, below and blah, 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 blah. 
So I think that it doesn't make sense, and this is going to be a pretty serious takeaway for you if you come back to work and say later it doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> what? They will answer. If you still need layering, if you still love layering, maybe you don't need unified layering for all your monolithic application. Maybe we can let our services within our monolithic code base choose their own layering. Why not? Maybe you have part of your application that can benefit from CQRS with a separate query model. Do you really need to query your data through a service layer? Maybe you, you, maybe you shouldn't. Maybe it makes sense to relax some rules, and maybe some services does not, does not need, do not need layering at all. Who knows? And uh, usually we end up with layering because uh, our packages grow and there's a lot of functionality bubbles up, so just split your functionality into smaller parts. Just extract smaller functional units and extract some reusable stuff to third-party models and blah, blah. And that's enough about structure. That's how software architecture evolution looked like. All right, so we had a spaghetti-oriented architecture that, that, that's passed. We had a chance to talk about microservices or ravioli-oriented oriented architecture. And now we described lasagna-oriented architecture. And I'm curious to know what's next. You know, that's always a question. Okay, pizza-oriented architecture. Pizza. Okay, cool. Undocumented architecture. And you say, this guy is going to talk about documenting things because we hate documentation. Do we have people here who, who is good at writing documentation? Okay, same for me. But I have to be honest with you. I hated documentation too. But right now, I embrace writing documentation because at least I can benefit from it personally. When I'm good at, at, documented, at documenting things, it actually teaches me how to structure information. And at least I can write a blog better. I can express my ideas better in a more con constructive way. It's about personal benefit. But I usually go to teams and they say, you don't have to document software because Agile manifesto says that we have to prefer working software over comprehensive documentation, right? That, that's what was written there. Prefer working software over comprehensive documentation. But it says prefer. 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 And there's a one more word, replace. Are they equal? Prefer is not the same as replace. It doesn't say replace uh, like a uh, documentation with a software or something like that. If there is a situation when you can replace documentation with a software or code, do it. But there are situations when you can't really. And it says also about comprehensive documentation. Working software or comprehensive documentation. So it doesn't really say that working software is important than good documentation which is kind of absurd, right? So yeah, who cares? So the thing is that usually here that architecture is code. Architecture is code. Don't document your software or your process, whatever. But the thing is that level of abstraction of a code is negligible, it's too, it's too small. Like, it's like a, you can't really see the bi uh, big picture. And one more objective, objection is I remember everything. I remember everything. And that's what usually happens with the people who remember everything. Yeah. Na, na, na. They go after a conference, after a beer, uh, whoa! You see? He's a lucky guy, but usually people are, not, uh, people are not that lucky. So, I think that we should learn how to document things because it's a skill. It's painful at the beginning, but as continuous literature say, bring the pain forward, right, docs, right? And it's not a pain anymore. We can just mark down some fancy stuff. And the question comes, why? Because for me personally, I don't really know how to express backups, disaster recovery, redundancy, failure, ETL, SLA in Java. I don't know how to code this, uh, these things, but I think that these are important things, right, to understand for everyone. Significant decisions. When you scale software development and people join your, your team, you have to constantly answer the same questions over and over again. Why don't you use MongoDB instead of MySQL? We have discussed it, and the, only, and the best thing that you can do to show some decisions that you took historically, but you don't have anything to show, right? And you have to answer it all the time. 
or surrounding dependency services, consumers, how to onboard your people, bird's eye technical view. You can't really express it via code. And I have a story for you. I used to work as a software development manager in a large organization. And um, it's, it was very hard to find the developers. And therefore, we, we decided to bring outsourcing company on board to help us with the delivery. Outsourcing came, like uh, 15 developers, and uh, they came to my desk and said, Eddie, we really want to understand how our, your software works. And we had a bunch of services, all the process. So we, it was an internal software development, internal product, and we covered everything. So actually, together with, with the team, we had to explain everything to these 15 guys. And we spent a few weeks on that. And this, yes, we explained them how we get things done. We onboarded these guys. And after a few weeks, internal audit came to us. Hey, guys, can you explain us how your system works? And I just, you know, it, it, it was like doc explaining everything on the paper, so we didn't have actually spend time on document it improperly. So we had to explain it once again. Audits left, and then Management changed it, and they, they brought their own software developers. They asked once again how our systems work. And at that point, I want to commit suicide. I just wanted to commit suicide. But what saved me? I didn't have a pistol. I didn't have a gun. And I just love myself. You know, that's the two things that solved me. So documentation is good. It's good, and it's skill. So you have to learn how to document crucial parts. It saves time at scale. If you're in a small like a team, you don't bother. But once you grow, you have to spend some time. And this should be part of your culture. That's a good thing. And uh, I had one guy in the team who was so good at documentation that he didn't really want to communicate. He didn't want to talk to people. <laughs> That's the second extreme, right? You don't want to go there, right? So it's, it's about balance. So like a <laughs> right? And what's important as well, that shitty out-of-date documentation is much more worse than lack of documentation. If you don't want to learn how to write docs, don't do that. Because shitty out-of-date doc will confuse everyone. Don't do that. It should be part of your culture. It should be part of your definition of done. So yeah, something like that. Everyone hates UML. I, th I, I think that uh, because I'm... I'm talking about documentation. You might think that I, like, I encourage you to learn UML. No, I encourage you to, to forget about this. Forget about, about UML because it just sucks. It's too hard to understand. It's, like a, it's too complicated. For me, I, I, I admire people who, who know how to document, how, how to build these diagrams, but it was painful to learn it, right? It was a pain. It was a pain. So there's a better way called C4. Uh, coined by Simon Brown. Context, containers, components, and classes. Very lightweight way how to express your architecture in diagrams. And by the way, diagrams look fancy. Monkey, Twitter, GitHub, blah, blah. So there are a lot of examples uh, in Simon Brown's book. So I, I think that you can go to this reference and just check later. But in fact, when you organize your software around services, you can generate this fancy documentation automatically. Just a killer feature. OK, optimistic architecture. Things never fail, right? Everything will be good. Everything will be good. But all we know that fault tolerance is a lesson, it's a lesson best learned offline, right? We'll learn about fault tolerance when we go down, and that's when we run post-mortems and that's what, how we can improve things and blah, blah. So return to this fantastic guy, Optimist. Basically, all we know that we live in a constrained environment. CPU is limited, memory is limited, everything is limited, right? Networking. We live in an unreliable environment. Things fail and unpredictable. Things never fail glamorously. <laughs> I haven't heard about any glamorous failure ever. Otherwise, I would know how to prevent it. Things fail somehow in the, in the worst possible way all the time. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Four minutes left. Wow. So, raise your hand if you know what connection or thread pools your application has. Raise your hand. 
One guy, and keep, keep, keep your hand raised. Great, guys, keep your hand raised. Okay, their approximate size. Awesome, just keep, keep your hand raised. Utilization during peak load. There is a peak load usually at the software, right? At nights or days, it depends. Okay, and what happens when the pools uh, approach the limit? What happens? Great, <laughs> out of memory. At least you know that out of memory will happen. Maybe you can prevent it somehow, but still, you know that out of memory will happen. So there is a, a bunch of things actually that tend to happen and you, usually we don't really know how to timely react on it and it ends up something like this. You're like, bam! And then you get a call from your owners or managers and that's the worst call that you ever can have. Hello? And there's silence. And you have to explain something right now. That's the worst feeling. I had that and I said, I said hello. <laughs> something like that. That's weird. So there are things that we have to care about. Many of them. And there's a finite list of things, basically. There are things that we have to care about which we don't do for some reason. So I'm not going to cover them right now. I'm not going to cover them. I'll cover only patterns without covering them in details. You can fight against these common problems. I'll refer you to books. Who read this one? Come on, people! People, please! The only thing that you have to remember after this presentation that you have to go to a bookstore and, and buy this one. Don't buy this one. S start with, a, with a important things. And I will steal five more minutes, sorry for that. Alchemy architecture. There's a mag magic happens. Just take a look. He, he takes a chair. Just look at this. And he ends up a sofa. <laughs> How can it, how, how it's possible? So, okay. Uh, basically, all came architecture happens when you join the team and no one can actually, <laughs> everyone has opinion on architecture, how things are done, but no one can explain why. <laughs> but everyone has opinion and no one can explain why, uh, which is weird. So I like this, uh, I like running the following sanity check when I joined the company. I joined the team and I grab a guy fr from a team in a, for a private discussion, for a coffee discussion, and I, I ask some, about some architectural question. Let's say, why do these two components communicate via uh, messaging? Why they don't communicate via REST API? And there are four possible answers. First one, I don't know. <laughs> someone knows. I had to go and ask someone, probably Ivory Tower architect. I have to figure it out. And they usually mean documentation, which is out of date, right? And I know, say, I know, he's convinced that he knows. But chances are that he's wrong. <laughs> and that's a problem, because when I do the same with the rest of the team, I ask the same questions, and answers are absolutely different. Absolutely different. So you just combine the answer and you see that people don't really have a shared understanding of their architecture and why they do things in a particular way, which is uh, insane because architecture should really grow controllably, right? Controllably. We have to control our architecture. But how can we control something that we don't understand? That's weird, right? And a few, few ideas, basically, how can we make sure that people ride the same bus, people understand architecture together. So, first of all, make sure that architecture is visible for everyone. I like the same, very simple practice, just get together, just get together, and uh, run this fun exercise. Just draw your, your actual architecture together, somewhere on the board, take a picture of it and print it out multiple times. And pin one, uh, like a major architecture picture, somewhere on a whiteboard and it will serve as a focal point for communication, right? Good thing. Actual state, you have to understand where you are. Before you understand where to go, you'll have to understand where you are. Where you are, the next thing that you can do, you have to know where to go. So draw the same picture, but with the expected ideal architecture. So you will see something like this, like actual state, expected state. If you go from a uh, monolithic architecture towards microservices, it will look like this. <laughs> yeah, it usually looks like this, 
right, from, 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 uh, from, from monolithic big ball of mud towards this distributed big ball of mud. Obviously, you have to make sure that everyone is involved in decision making. And I like the idea that when you get together, when you discuss some architectural stuff, you have to maintain a list of decisions somewhere because usually everyone can't really attend meeting, but decisions are important. So what I usually do, I encourage people to use like Confluence, something like this. There, uh, there, uh, there was a get together about architecture. Here are takeaways. You, you just create a document, like a, let's say, Test all changes, even very technical, or wrap all SQL statements with SQL methods, something like that. And then integrate with a chat system, like a Slack on a heap chat. I, I made Slack bigger because it's better. <laughs> Slightly bigger, right? But it's better. So, and then when people receive notifications who were not there, the most interesting things happen. They start asking questions like this. <laughs> <laughs> So, and everyone is on the same bus at the end of the day, right? And the last thing, architectural pitch, basically. Uh, in the one product company, uh, we decided that basically product guys who want to develop, produce some cool feature, they'll have to pitch it in front of the team. So the first thing that you do as a product manager or product owner, yeah, you just come to the team and say, we have to do this in this particular way because it will save millions uh, uh, dollars, it will increase revenues, it's a great thing, wow, 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 wow. So we have to pitch your product idea in front of the team. And I realized that we can apply the same technique as software developers. When you start developing something, get together with your team and pitch how you see your implementation. How do you see the way you implement things? And discussions start to happen around it, right? And that's the... If everyone agrees, great, go on and implement. Probably you'll have some suggestions and blah, blah. But if someone says that it's nonsense, it's a bad idea, man. It's a bad idea. It's also great. It's a time to solve this at the earliest possible stage, right? Get some like a box fight, but come to shared understanding and common agreement. And I think that we missed some coffee break. That's it. Thank you. Oh, uh -huh. if you have questions, I think that you can ask them right yeah. now, or yeah. we can have a coffee or beer. Roman have two, two, uh, two bottles, so he said no. So uh, we have other one uh, questions? Someone? Next time. Next, next time. time. Next, next time. So thank you. Okay, thank and you. And applause.